Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Tea Talks. Uh, today we are with uh, Abhijit. Uh, he is with us. Uh, he he was with us uh, during the year. Uh, he made a, an episode uh, on neuroscience, and today we are going to talk about a special uh, leader uh, at the Turk uh, with him. Uh, okay, Abhijit, if you want, uh, you can start with yourself. Uh, you can introduce yourself, then we can continue with the topic today's topic. Hello, Reza Daruk, and hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. And Maraba for the Turkish ones. So, I am a neuroscientist, as you would know, but my work involves a vast domain of human nature. And human nature includes everything that we do. I mean, we are people. So, whether you are in politics, whether you are in sociology, whether you are in technology, when you understand the people better, you will do everything in your life better. And that's precisely my work, to understand the people better and relate it to every single aspect of human society. Yeah, I think so. And human science uh, are really multidisciplinary, so you need anything about human, uh, including all kind of science. So I know what, what you mean, actually. And also, uh, history is about, uh, it, it's including history, you know. And I think uh, while uh, making some research on historic topics, uh, you met with Atatürk. And uh, as uh, I know uh, from you, you made a deep research about him. And you decided to dedicate a book to him. Uh, I'm going to explain uh, some. I'm, I'm going to share some information about Atatürk to non-Turkish followers of us. Uh, Atatürk is founder of uh, modern Turkey, uh, Turkish Republic, and he's a reformist actually. And uh, he was leader of the independence uh, war of Turkey against uh, some imperialist uh, cultures, uh, imperialist armies, uh, and um, for. After uh, the independence, uh, he was the leader of uh, New Turkey. He founded uh, Turkish Republic, and uh, he was a leader of a reform. Uh, reform. He was a reformist leader, and he was a leader of the transformation of a Turkish uh, culture uh, from an Islamic one to modern one. So, uh, Abhijit, could you share your journey from the motivation to the endpoint while uh, making a research? about him. Uh, what what was your motivation and how did you uh, complete your research? Can you share with us? Um, first of all, I've never considered myself to be of any specific nation. Mm -hmm. I have tried because when I'm trying to understand the people or the human life as it is, human existence as it is, if you place a label on yourself, like the place you are born in or the culture you are born in, then you are automatically limiting yourself from understanding the true, the vastness of human nature, right? So, and there comes one of the many cultures that have influenced my work, influenced me, the idea called Nascar or the works of Nascar as it is. One of the most important cultures has been Turkey from the very beginning. Ataturk came later. Uh, in the beginning, I came into touch with the culture of Turkey through the works of Mevlana, or for, for the Western population, he is known as Rumi, but we call it Mevlana in the native world. So uh, that is in the original culture. Mm -hmm. And from him, I came, into, I came to learn about the works of uh, Shams of Tabrizi. And I have learned a great deal from their works about, about love, about kindness, about, about reformation, the one that we are talking about today. Yeah. Yet, when we talk about Ataturk, he personally, I mean, he was greatly against these concepts, these dervishes, these ideas of, especially the idea that religion could control the democracy or control the population. 
So what he did separated the two, religion and politics, or religion as state. He separated the two. And that was an important step. That still remains an important step for any nation that is trying to move ahead. And I'll tell you why. We'll go get to that. So first, why I came to uh, be influenced, or I had a kind of personal relation to Atatürk in that way, like I have with many other leaders of the world. Yet in this aspect, Atatürk is unique. I mean, we can call him, uh, you have called him a reformist leader, and we have in social sciences and political sciences, we have a specific term, they, they use the term uh, benevolent dictators. Dictators, oh, yeah. but benevolent, mm-hmm. which means they have a concern for the society. So whatever they are doing, they're doing for the betterment of the society, even if the people do not like his decisions at the moment. Mm-hmm. So that's why oftentimes Arthur is defined as a benevolent dictator. So if we want to, now religion is never the problem. The problem has always been extremism. The problem has always been fundamentalism. Religion has never been the problem. That's why, uh, I mean, today that's why the atheist population of the world keep uh, raising these walls within themselves that religion is completely false and uh, completely unhealthy. Actually, in our studies in neuroscience and psychology, we have enough data to prove that religion actually induces health benefits, religious rituals and all of those health benefits in the individual life of a person. But here's the point. How do we relate that health benefit to the benefit of a nation? Because something may be personally beneficial for you, that is for me as an individual, but that specific practice doesn't necessarily benefit the population, especially if that practice is controlling a population politically. So we had to, so Atatürk did this most important thing. He separated religion and state. He Turned out he went on in a path of destroying monarchs and kings and queens and all of those. And he built a republic. He basically dragged the country from the medieval times and placed it in the 21st century. Absolutely. That's why he is important, Mm -hmm. along with uh, um, Honest Abe or Abraham Lincoln, along with Sebastian de Bose of India, along with many other important. Calling they, these people leaders does not justify them. They are much more than that. Yeah. I mean, it's today. It's a transformation have, of a society, actually. Yes, exactly. We, in, in social sciences and political sciences, scientists or these researchers, they come up with terms to try to understand these people. So they have yeah. termed him. He is often called a dictator, and he is often called a benevolent dictator. But how do you change a people? How do you change their orthodox, na- orthodox nature into a civilized one, into, into a more secular one, into a more inclusive one? So if you have to do that in a time when the entire region is almost medieval, then you have to take some tough decisions that people may not like it. And I have been watching certain documentaries, uh, people in Turkey are still uh, do not like the fact that the alphabets were transformed from Arabic to the Latin alphabet. But Atatürk himself said, if you want to develop a country, you have to adapt your own, I- own country with new ideas. You have to adapt to the developing world. Otherwise, you will fall behind. And that's why he has been important. And that's why he, he is a person that anybody who's learning about social progress, who's learning about development, who's learning about taking his or her own society ahead, 
should learn from that person, from these individual unique people. Thank you very much. And uh, for example, I I know your uh, ideas and I know your definition about uh, reformist, you know, uh, but would you like to share, uh, would you like to define a reformist uh, for your side, your per perspective? And uh, how do you position Atatürk uh, as a reformist leader or not? How do you position it uh, in accordance with your definition? Uh, first of all, you see, I, I don't like these labels, you know. I mean, I also do not like labeling these important figures with terms that could have a million meaning for a million people. Different people consider a single term differently. So once you label a person with a certain term, other people would automatically comprehend that person based on their own understanding of that term. So how do I define Atatürk? Okay, first of all, we need to understand the very concept or the very first, idea first, of... First of all, uh, the question is that, how do you define a reformist? Exactly, yes, and that's... Yeah. Yes, and then so to understand, how do you position how do, I, how do we define reformist? We have to understand what is a reform? What is reformation? And now for that, we have to take a stand, take a ground. We have to stand on the ground. What kind of ground do we stand on? We stand on the ground of humanity. So we stand on the ground of humanity. From that ground, we try to see the world. We have to first place ourselves outside our cocoons. We have to forget who we are. We have to forget our cultures, everything. I mean, for the, for the time being, for the time of the observation, Think of yourself just as a human, nothing else. So what is reformation? And what the human mind is capable of when we are talking about reformation? We humans have been primitive animals for millions of years. And those primitive tenets, those tenets of animal nature have been inside of us for much longer than our civilized characteristics, than our characteristics of um, conscience, reason, uh, rationality, and even secularism. So these are much new properties of human nature. So we have been living in the jungle where we had to fight with other animals. We had to fight with other tribes. At that time, being ferocious, being violent, being a savage, actually served the purpose of survival. But we then started to evolve, become more capable mentally as our brains began to become, they became more complex, they became more, more dense, thick, and they had more connections. So we started to develop new faculties, the faculties of reason, the faculties of creativity, and much more. So we developed civilizations. We developed the modern society. But this has happened only recently. Before that, for millions of years, we lived in the jungle. So those properties still are inside of us. And that's why comes the concept of, in psychology, we call it neuropsychology. We call it cognitive dissonance, the conflict that a person has between themselves. In, in, in the religious aspect, or from the Islamic tradition, we call it jihad, except the term has been completely destroyed. It has been, it is understood as something completely negative. But that's not the jihad we are talking about. From the Sufi perspective, from the, from the esoteric perspective, Jihad is just an inner conflict between the good and the evil inside of us that we have to fight every single moment. So that cognitive dissonance, that conflict goes on between us, inside of us. And once we understand that what we are doing, are we doing based on our primitive tenets, our primitiveness, or is it something 
that could take us ahead. Whether it is racism, whether it is fundamentalism, whether it is thinking that, so there is two types of thinking. One comes from the savage days, another is modern or civilized. One thinking says that the savage self, so we can call it, we have two selves. One self inside of us says, my culture is the best. My culture is the greatest of all. All others are inferior. That's the savage tenet from our primitive days because at that time, thinking strongly of oneself made us fight others much better. So it improved our capacities. It made us stronger and made us survive easily. Then we have another self, the civilized self, which says, I have my own strongholds, but another person has their own strongholds. I am born in a culture. There is no denying that. There will always be certain personal attachment to that culture. But that doesn't mean that a person in born in another culture is any way inferior or any way less than what I am. So that's where comes, that's where the very idea or the very desire for reformation is born. The idea for inclusion, the desire for inclusion, that I am what I am, I am who I am, but I'm not the best. I am who I am, I have my capacities, I have my flaws, but another person from a different corner of the world, they have their own capacities, they have their own flaws, because they are just as human as we are. And we have to embrace these strengths of each other. Only then we can grow as a species. Now, why do we need to grow as a species? Before, when we lived in the jungle, when we lived in the caves, we lived as tiny little tribes. But today, that day, that is long gone. Today, we are not living in tribes. We are in the, in the course of becoming a global species. So it is only logical that we be inclusive in our attitude, not just in speaking, in talking, but in feeling as well. I mean, we have to feel inside of us really the desire that I am as, I need to accept others as my own reflections. I need to accept others just as human as I am. So that's where reformation is born. And that's where Ataturk comes in. Ataturk comes in because he had a desire for that uh, next step, the next step of acceptance, the next step of inclusion. So he, he, first of all, he did many things and I do not need to analyze them that what would have been better at that point. But uh, he converted uh, mosques into museums and he transformed the language. He basically made an entire population learn basically a new alphabet. And that also helped Turkey to become a part and made the people aware of, uh, become a part of the global society of, of the civilized world. And I'm not saying that Arabic is any uncivilized or anything like that. But there are certain steps that made the people, made the inclusion easier. And the transformation of the alphabets was one of them. Then uh, he basically banned the phase at that time, the dresses. He basically changed the clothes. So, he, I mean, in, th in this time, I don't think it would be possible to do things like the way he did. And that's why perhaps he is called as a dictator. Maybe he was, what is a dictator? We invent these terms, dictators and leaders, basically the same thing. If a person, if a person, if you have the consent of the people and a people are happy what you're doing, even if you are doing the worst atrocities in the world, you would be called a leader by the people. And, but if you are doing something that the people do not like, yet you may be right. You may be doing something for the next step, for the civilized world, 
to become more humane, for that specific population to become more humane, at that point of time, you may be called a dictator. For the next, but the future generation would not see you that way, would only see you as an important step for our nation's progress. Absolutely, actually, uh, I agree with you. And uh, your definition, and you used the terms dictator and leader together. And it's a different approach, actually. But uh, when I hear your uh, definition and the uh, explanation about your approach, I agree with you, actually. You're right. And uh, the progress of the society that is the topic uh, today we are talking about. So that's the important, uh, these are the important steps for the progression of a society. And uh, while you were beginning, uh, starting your speech, you uh, gave the steps of the societies uh, and it's not so far away uh, that we were in jungles, we were in caves, you know our tribes for Endar. And uh, if we make a comparison with uh, the world's age, uh, with the progress of the humanity, it's so slow actually. And today uh, we are not so far from the cave stage or jungle stage, as you mentioned. And But, uh, you know, as the human society, as the human nature actually, uh, sorry for the wrong words. Uh, the prediction about the future is a behavior, common behavior of the people, humanity. And uh, from the beginning of the history, many people were trying to make forecasts, make predictions about the future, you know. And you know, the today we call it as futurism, but it was uh it wasn't futurism before it was like making uh what was the word about it i i couldn't remember now uh, the people were forecasting the future like which spot fortune not, tellers which, fortune tellers sorry uh it was fortune teller before but now it's a professional concept and it is uh, called as futurism but the main difference with uh, fortune teller it's based on data it's based on trends and it's based on an analyze of the, uh, this kind of trends, you know. Uh, so if you uh, look at uh, a futurism concept, uh, a reformist, uh, could, can a reformist uh, have to uh, carry these kind of futurism skills. And if we, if we are talking about Atatürk today, uh, do you define him as a good futurist, as a leader? People often ask me that, how do I frame my works, my works of science and psychology and neuroscience in such a humane fashion? My only answer is, I do not know. And if you ask a river, how does this flow the way it does? It doesn't know, it just flows it the way it does. So a reformist or a reformer is, is a foundation, is, is a data that futurists use to predict. So imagine, a reformer is a future happening in the present. It is. So what could happen in the future is happening right now because I am a living manifestation of that future. Atatürk was the living manifestation of the next step of secularism, of humanism, of assimilation at his own time in that specific population. So he mean uh, it's irrelevant whether we call him, I mean, futurism, the concept futurism is the idea of predicting the future. Now, there is a difference between predicting the future and causing the future. 
Now, if you know certain predictions, if you know certain uh, trends, it may help in your own cause, in your own path, whatever you're doing. So you can use that data, you can use those trends to smoothen your path, to go faster in your own direction. But it, it's not necessary that you need to be a personally a futurist because when you are yourself the next step, people, other people will be studying you to predict the next step. You are those footsteps. Every population is founded, the entire humankind is founded upon these pillars, upon these footsteps. And each step, each pedestal is an important part of the progress of entire humanity. Take away one step and the future or the progression of the entire society would collapse. Now, what he did, he had a, uh, I wouldn't call futurist necessarily, but I would definitely call a visionary. So he had his own vision. He had his own vision of what uh, a progressive nation should look like. That's why he, he took the nation out of medieval times and industrialized it in his own lifetime. Now, why is it important? I mean, it takes a nation uh, several, even we could say more than 100 years, like several centuries, to reach the transformation that he did in his own lifetime industry, secularism, humanism, all of that. And that's why he is important. He may not, uh, he understood the progression of uh, the Western society. He understood the direction that the world was going, regardless whether it was from the West or the East. I mean, Turkey itself is standing in the middle uh, between the West and the East. It's the bridge between the two. And and Bosphorus is literally the bridge between the two. So futurism is predicting the future. Then these people, so every single field has its part to play in the society. We had fortune tellers, we had different things, but they, they studied the stars and all of this. I mean, at that time they had to be creative. And at that time uh, we had no data. There was a lot of anxieties. So the purpose behind these professions at that time, that is fortune telling and all of those tarot cards and astrology and all of that, the purpose of them at that time was to reduce the anxiety of the people. And any idea that reduces the anxiety of the people would automatically be embraced by the population unless the people are rational themselves. So that happened in the past. But today, it is, people are not so gullible anymore. I mean, yeah, some people would still need these things, but in general, people are not so gullible anymore that they would believe in the stars and predictions and all of that. But we have the data from technology. We have, especially with the rise of artificial intelligence, we have the data. So here we need to, understand just a little bit, what is artificial intelligence in the first place? I mean, futurism, the entire concept, the entire profession has had this huge leap because of the contributions of artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Anything that reduces human effort is artificial intelligence. I'm wearing this glass. It may not have any technology in it, but itself definitely does have intelligence in it because it makes up for the vision disparities that I have in my eyes. So it reduces human effort. So it is a technology in a way. It is an artificial intelligence in a way. Now, make it complex thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Suddenly we have a machine. Suddenly we have a circuit board. We have uh, this chips and smartphones and all of that. Every single technology 
regardless whether it is silicon based or any just a basic bow and arrow that is also artificial intelligence because it's reducing human effort giving the humans a great capacity to uh, protect themselves from animals in the wild or and at the same time uh, gather food by killing those animals so it is artificial which they may not be able to do without them so it is giving them the capacity it is artificial intelligence it is artificial and it is intelligent now make it more complex so we have today computers then we when we made the computers even more complex then we have what we today call artificial intelligence but the artificial intelligence idea itself is nothing new it has been there from the very beginning of uh, humankind's endeavors in um uh, discoveries from the invention of wheels and in controlling of fire everything so the more complex we get in our technological advancements the more advanced machines we will have and the more we will have access to human nature through these various platforms we have social media we have different things that's why these data are uh, these data are now being used in different fields we even uh people are using social media to gather doing the surveys and everything now when everybody is using the same platform automatically their own reflection you're going to see in the data received from that platform so futurists gather these data and they study them and it is not so hard to predict the next step or it will be much much it is very much likely that that's how we are going to go ahead now it does two things otherwise one thing is these people gather the data they predict the next step and that's it i give it to you do whatever you want with it but that's not the way to go the other the step is gather the data understand it study it and see where the people are going in which direction the people are going and try to understand from a scientist perspective how we could present the data in a way that would influence human nature human behavior in the society so that the people would understand the implications of their own behavior in the society so that take their own step take a rational step take a better step as a human being like abtuk made his entire population do in his own lifetime even if they did not like it some people many people do not like it they still do not like it but it was necessary it was imperative so he may not have been a futurist he may not have studied so much data because at that time there was not a it was not available at that time so much data but he definitely had the vision what a progressive nation should look like and that's why the steps that he took those specific steps despite in in the face of all obstructions in the face of all odds the steps that he took that perseverance that strength of character those things they are in Yes. So uh we I I couldn't hear your last words actually. Uh if you want you can say it again I yeah, think yeah, your phone was calling. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I can recap it. Okay. So okay. the this this he may not have been absolute may not have been a futurist but he definitely was a visionary and the strength of character that he showed the vision that he had for a civilized nation for a progressive nation for a humane nation that character is something that everybody should learn from and that strength of character and that vision is immortal do you hear me right now okay yes yes okay and uh if you want we can uh recap a little bit and uh if you 
on to add anything else uh, to your speech because no, no I was going was, to end there anyways. Yeah, yes, because because it was really good uh, to hear uh, our country's founders' uh, vision from you, uh, and uh, his words uh, about the future, for example. Uh, one of them was the future is uh, on the skies. So uh, it it was his words uh, in accordance with some data that he collected from the uh, trends in the world. Uh, because during his age, uh, you know, uh, there was the uh, plane was invented, uh, discovered, and uh, it was developing day and day. Uh, the innovation uh, was, uh, the innovation uh, projects, uh, innovative projects were uh, considered uh, on this kind of planes. Uh, th that was about war because, you know, the especially uh, in the last uh, 200 years uh, period, uh, the innovation uh, was always focusing on the war and the war missions, you know. Uh, but the word about the uh, future is that, or on sky, uh, is a key uh, indicator about uh, his prediction and his vision, actually. And also, uh, what do you think about uh, your project uh, will you write a book about him because you shared with me you you are going to dedicate a book to him uh, what's your plan about it and uh, while sharing your recap with us and last words uh, could you share also uh, the progress about your book with us actually uh, it's already out i mean my last that one that we are talking about so this shoot is sanctitude that's the title and i dedicated it to him Because a, a great deal of, he was basically not a leader. He was a servant of the society. And he made it visible in, in his every first step. I'm not saying he's flawless and all of that. I mean, those are for the historians to debate over. I don't like debates. Every single person has flaws. Every single person has errors. It is impossible to be a human and be without errors. So that's where the trouble begins. People start focusing on the errors and they start debating instead of learning from these people. So I dedicated the book Servitude and Sanctitude to Ataturk. I didn't know about him in detail in the beginning. I mean, as I told him, uh, I came in contact with the Turkish culture from the works of Mevlana and Shams of Tabrizi. I came to learn about Atatürk much later. Then I uh, studied him in detail. And just as much as I have studied other important figures in world history. And so he was a visionary. He was a servant of the society. And he, if he was a dictator, then he was a dictator to Turkey, so that Turkey would never have a dictator. And although I'm a bit worried about it right now, I mean, the things that he did are beginning to get reversed at this moment. So it is, there are things to worry about the current political state. And it's turning back, the clock is reversing. So again, the things are in the hands of the people. If the people allow it, So th th this is an important, important stage, important time, moment for Turkey to see what happens, whether they will allow the reversal, the pro progress that Ataturk did and made it regress backwards, or they take a stand. I'm not going to take names because I said we are going to keep political figures out of it. So we're going to keep it out. But again, the A person, an individual, all he can do is live his life as a living example of the future, of the vision that he possesses. But after he is gone, it depends on the people whether they are going to live by that example or they are going to regress back where they were before the person came into life. So it depends again on the people. An individual takes people ahead. 
but the people it is ultimately the duty of the people so as i said all my works are now related somewhat to every single aspect of the society to from technology i have the one on technology is called the gospel of technology it is on the impact of technology then from politics and social science and everything you cannot understand a society without understanding its history why is history important because there have been many mistakes there have been many strengths so we have to learn about all of them only then we can choose the logical and humane step to take uh, in the next day or tomorrow or today so whatever we need to do we need to do today we cannot just hope or pray for some leader some other to to come and take us ahead each and every person has to become the other to each and every person has to become the mevlana each and every person has to become the christ and take their own society ahead on their own shoulders thank you very much abhijit for today uh, i hope we can meet in another uh, episode uh, with you and uh, with another topic uh, but as a human scientist as a neuroscientist uh, you were uh, you are really capable about uh, your multidisciplinary other uh, business uh, other science topics and uh, the areas study areas i mean uh, first of all i'm really grateful uh, about your participation to our uh, program uh, on youtube uh, would you like to uh, say something to our followers because uh, from the previous episode that was uh, the, that was your uh, topic about the uh, neuroscience we have a uh, really good feedbacks from our followers uh, many of them were non uh, unaware about you and uh, would you like to say anything to them uh, while uh, closing the session so i wanted to uh, i have been very uh, happy to do this with you another episode with you as i said because i was born in the land of india then i was nourished in turkey even and then spread across the world from america and so today i live as a human not of any single culture not of any single uh, country just as a human and i always keep on learning from every single corner of the society from every single person i don't see anybody as less than me everybody has something that i could learn from and that's why every single discussion every single talk is important to me no matter who i'm having them with in our last discussion we are talking uh, about neuroscience and about artificial intelligence and about their impact in the lives of the lives of people and the society so in closing this i would say that again no matter how much an individual does whether i do or whether the turk did or any other leader did or any other scientist did ultimately if all of this work do not contribute to bringing the people together and taking them ahead reducing their differences reducing their prejudices reducing their uh, sectarian attitude then all of this technology all of the scientific discoveries all of this vision all of it is useless so if we do not have people next to us then we don't have life in us i mean what are we going to do with technology what are we going to do with all these borders and guns and all of that people first then those labels america turkey india and all of them let them be as they are let the borders be outside not inside of us thank you very much abhijit for your thoughts for your nice thoughts uh, that was good to see you uh, thank you very much to everyone uh, who is following us who is uh, watching us uh, have a nice day abhijit i hope to see you again you too have a great time